This is the one thing that you don't want to happen when traveling over an elevated railway. I probably don't need to say why. You know, crashing is never a good day's occurrence. And a day in May 2021, this would be a nightmare that would become a reality. Would the cause of this disaster be construction, maintenance, or even an act of God, or all of the above? Well, watch until the end to find out. Today we're covering the Mexico City overpass collapse. My name is John, and welcome to Plainly Difficult. This video wouldn't have been possible if it wasn't for my Patreon and YouTube members. If you want to watch my videos early access and ad-free, then feel free to check it out. So today's subject I think really hits my Venn diagram of disaster geekery, trains and structural failures. To make the plain difficult disaster trinity, we really needed some kind of reactive angle to our story. But alas, not today. Regardless, it's an interesting, albeit tragic event, definitely worth studying. Our story begins in the mid-1980s with, like all railway-based subjects, a need for people to be whisked around an area. And in today's case, it is the bustling Mexico City. I should say that the city had a metro dating back to 1969 when Line 1 opened. And throughout the years, the network would be extended, modified and built upon. Part of the 1980s plan was to build a line serving the southern part of Mexico City. This was to be called Line 12. However, although being shown on the 1985 programmer Maestro de Metro, the route wouldn't be birthed until some 30 years later. Over the years, the 12 line plan sat on the burner, the route's topography changed, but although following the general course around the city, its elevation would be altered, from originally a largely underground affair to a mixed womble assortment of underground and overground alignments. Interestingly, the change came with a change in rolling stock from the French-originated rubber-tired to the more conventional steel-tired shebang. The change in elevation from mostly underground was mainly a cost-saving measure, as tunnels are insanely expensive to construct. It ran subterranean through the central section still. However, it then ran in other parts outside of the central core on elevated sections. By the early 2000s, the line had finally entered the construction phase, with building starting on the 23rd of September 2008. The line welcomed the public for the first time in October 2012. However, a little bit before, test running had occurred on the weekends leading up to the opening day. Running over budget, the project cost 26 billion pesos, which is around 1.3 billion US dollars. Calling it 20 stations, the route was mainly double tracked and powered by overhead lines. The line used FE10 Metro trains built by CAF. V7 car units had an estimated capacity of just shy of 1,500 people. But almost right from the start, the shiny new line had a few issues. Vibrations were reported along the elevated sections. Not good. So much was it not good, but after just a few months, multiple sleepers had found to be failed necessitating a severely reduced speed restriction of 5 km an hour across the affected sections. Not the best start for a brand new railway line. You see the reason for the lower speed was that broken sleepers could mean that the running rails are not fully secure and thus can fall out of gauge, increasing the chance of a derailment. The problem would require the elevated section of the line to be shut down for some 20 months commencing in 2014. During the closure, a report would find that the area needed some 1.2 billion pesos in remediation work, which included 12 issues with improper track gauge, wheel profiling issues, and a general increased risk of derailment. And even it was found that the track ballast was inadequate for the job. Eventually, the sections were reopened, but confidence wouldn't be restored, as in 2017, earthquake Puebla damaged much of the line's tracks and a number of the stations. Locals reported cracks around the elevated section's concrete columns. The cracks were repaired, but yet more complaints came in, especially around the Olivo station area. As trains passed above, the overpasses reported to rumble and move under the weight of the rolling stock. On top of this, the steel girders which carried the line were noticeably sagging under the weight. 
in order to combat this, extra steel supports were installed and column bases were widened. The line's operator, STC, employed engineering firm Ingeniera Servius Systemus Applicatus to conduct a study on the structural and geotechnical behaviour of the overpass near Oliver Station. They found no risk to the line's operation, and it's now safe to say that a part of my disaster bingo card will safely be stamped off. Right, I almost forgot we need to talk about the design and construction of those troublesome elevated sections. So the railway elevated sections were made up of reinforced concrete columns, upon which steel beams were laid. These were tied together using braces with diagonal beams. Two steel beams ran parallel to one another, and each span was met in the middle by a join in which two sections are connected together. The track bed isn't directly laid on the beams, however. Instead, it is placed on concrete slabs, and to tie the slabs together, the steel beams had steel studs welded to them and these went through the concrete. The studs tie the two materials together, which in theory should be solid as long as the welds are done properly. But remember this for later. So now we know about the structure, let's get on to the... Since we're on the topic of infrastructure, let's look at this story from this week's sponsor, Ground News. Biden proposes banning Chinese vehicles from US roads with software crackdown. More than 240 news sources are reporting on this story, around 40% from the left and 20% from the right. And when you look at the headlines, you'll notice a pretty big split in framing. On the left, most of the outlets discuss the details of the ban itself, like this one from Global News. However, on the right, there's a much heavier emphasis on potential national security concerns. Take a look at this article from La Parisian. Ground news is a tool that can help cut through the confusing world we live in. It gathers related articles from more than 50,000 sources around the world, and you get this all in one place, where you can compare how different outlets cover the same story. Every story comes with a visual breakdown of the political bias, reliability and ownership, all backed by ratings from free independent news rating organisations. One of my favourite features is My News Bias, where you can track your reading habits over time. Here I can see my most read news sources, the political breakdown of the stories I read, and even the most viewed topics like infrastructure. I have been liking the 2024 US election page, being a Brit, I'm watching this all from the sideline, but I like that it gives you the ability to fully compare the candidates and issues on the ballot. With Ground News' created coverage and blind spot sections, you can be sure you're getting every side of every story in this crucial election year. And what's great, Ground News are offering all my viewers 40% off their Vantage plan, which is what I use to get unlimited access to all of their incredible features. So go to ground.news slash plainly difficult or use the QR code on the screen to give it a try. I think Ground News is doing really important work and I hope that you'll give them a check out. Disaster. It is around 10.24 in the evening of the 3rd of May 2021 and an eastbound service is just departing to Zonko Station en route for its next stop at Olivos. Train driver Rodrigo Garcia, after departing the station, notices a violent jolt as the train moves along the line. We're just moments away from disaster, as the train is around 220 metres or 720 feet from Oliver Station, it enters a span between two columns. The first five carriages pass with no issue, but as the sixth enters the span, it gives way. The span still gird is split in two in the middle. This showered the road around five metres below with concrete debris. A passing car along the Tehak Avenue was hit by material. This impact killed the driver and severely injured the passenger. One of the train's carriages slammed into the ground and the final carriage was left dangling. The train had quickly come to a halt. The combination of being derailed and the line's relative slow speed of around 20 miles an hour meant much of the train's momentum was lost almost instantly. Rodrigo Garcia applied the train's emergency brakes and went back to investigate. After informing his control, he reached the fifth still accessible carriage. There he found multiple injured passengers, debris and smoke. Dust had been thrown up during the collapse, masking the full scale of the disaster to passers-by, but it was clear something tragic was happening. Emergency services were dispatched to the crash site. Rather understandably, there was concern of further collapses. As such, a crane was used to stabilise the structure around the damaged train carriages. The injuries varied from minor cuts and bruises to life-altering. 
The train was thought to be between a half and three quarters full at the time of the crash. In total, after rescue operations had ceased, over 90 people would be treated for injuries and sadly 26 lives would be lost, 15 of which had died at the scene of the crash. By the end of the 4th of May, both crash carriages were removed and by the end of the month, the area was cleared of all debris. The section of the line would languish unused for a couple of years as it was re-evaluated and repaired. It wouldn't be until January 2024 when the first passenger service would return to the newly repaired collapsed section. But how did such a tragedy unfold on a newish railway line? Well, get your disaster cards out because I think we might get very close to a full house. Investigation As early as during the initial rescue work, an investigation was going to happen as said in a BBC News article. Mexico City Mayor Claudia Scheinbaum said an external company would investigate the cause of the incident. Earlier, she said it had appeared that a girder had given way on the overpass. In the immediate aftermath, the line's ongoing issues unsurprisingly floated into the headlines. The Secretariat of Comprehensive Risk Management and Civil Protection hired Norwegian risk management firm DNV to investigate over three volumes the cause of the collapse. The first section, which was released in June 2021, focused in on the probable cause of the collapse. It highlighted a number of main points of failure, most of which were around the vital shear studs between the bridge's girders and concrete slabs. DNV identified defective shear stud welding to the steel girders, poorly executed welds, and it was found that protective ceramic rings used during installation were not removed, which should have been. What this meant was that the studs had significantly less surface to be welded to. As stated by DNV, failure to remove the protective ceramic reduced the area of adhesion. This led to the studs detaching from the steel girders. The concrete tied the two parallel girders together. Thus now independent from one another, the load was no longer spread throughout the structure and instead allowed the two steel girders to warp inwards towards one another, which eventually caused the bending V-shape of the overpass towards the ground. It reminds me of something that I always say to my eldest daughter after she has a trip or fall. Eventually, gravity always wins. The second DMV report came out in September 2021 and focused on the immediate cause, but this again brought the poorly welded studs back into focus. The third report was given to Mexico City's government on the 28th of February 2022. This focused on the root cause and for recommendations for the line's reopening, which wouldn't go down well with the powers that be but we'll have to come back to this in a little bit. But the DMV wouldn't be the only ones poking into the crash. The New York Times released their own report called Why the Mexico City Metro Collapsed. In their report, they found a number of concerning political pressures embroiling one of the country's richest people, Carlos Slim, whose company, Carso Infrastructure and Construction, built the section of the line that collapsed, and this was their first railway project. During inspections after the 2017 earthquake, issues with the collapse span's construction were found, as reported by the New York Times. The city found errors in the original construction of the section built by Mr. Slim's company, including incorrectly poured concrete and missing steel components. The NYT investigation found evidence the then head of the government of Mexico City, Marcelo Eraband, who had announced Line 12 back in 2007, was trying to rush through the project to be completed under his premiership as stated in the New York Times. In a rush to finish, the city demanded that construction companies open the subway well before Mr. Eraband's term as mayor ended in 2012. The scramble led to a frenzied construction process that began before a master plan had been finalised and produced a metro line with defects from the start. So what is interesting is what happened to DMV's third and final report. This part of the DMV contract was tasked with finding the root cause. It pointed the blame at the line's builder, a lack of independent certification and lack of maintenance. However, the Mexico City government refused to accept the third instalment. Instead, they did not release its findings and then cancelled the contract with DMV, as noted in an article by Proceso. Claudia Scheinbaum announced that she will sue Norwegian firm DNV because she said the third report on the collapse of Metro Line 12 tentious and false and serves the opposition. Now, unsurprisingly, I know very little about Mexican politics, so I won't go any further here. But from an ignorant outsider's view from a misted up window, it seems rather fishy. But what was agreed 
on the main is that poor welds of the shear studs was the mechanical failure of the overpass. Criminal charges would be brought, most notably against Line 12 project director Enrique Orcastius and nine former officials and supervisors. The charges were manslaughter, injury and property damage. Victims of the crash received payouts between 450,000 pesos around $21,000 to 6 million pesos around $290,000 from Carso Infrastructure and Construction. Although there are still a few individual lawsuits still remaining against the company. So it's scale time. I think it's going to be a free and this is what I've got for the disaster card. Do you agree? Let me know in the comments below. This is a Plain Difficult production. All videos on the channel Creative Commons Attribution Share Like Licensed. Plain Difficult videos are produced by me John in a currently mild corner of southern london uk and all that's left to say is thank you 